quick uh, introduction there. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, lovely to see people from all around the world in here. I'm I'm in Cambridge, uh, just slightly east of Cambridge at the moment. As you can see, probably out of my window, the sun has just set on a very sunny, almost spring-like day. Um, so it's very nice to see you all. So um, uh, as Sean said, uh, I've um, I've been dedicated quite a while now to looking at virtual reality and immersive technologies, and that's something that has become uh, increasingly of interest, I think, around the world as people have shifted to online learning, and there's this perceived loss um, of physical learning spaces. And I think uh, there's been quite a turn to immersive technologies to try and compensate in some way for this perceived loss. But it's not all bad. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is really about the role of agency, but mainly focused on online learning and teaching. I'm going to be drawing on some theory, um, some practical examples from my teaching, but also from um, the teaching of my colleagues. Um, I'm also a teacher trainer, and as, as Sean said, a learning technologist. And we're going to have a look at how technology and pedagogy can work together and can be used in terms of assessment for learning um, and how you can use technology as a, dri a driver and a facilitator of both teacher and learner agency. And I think this is something that um, is particularly relevant now um, with the global pandemic uh, affecting the way that we that we do everything in our lives, but um, especially teaching and learning. Uh, I can see some people saying lo lots of sound, lost sound. Uh, I don't know whether I should be paying attention to that. Can, every can everybody hear me? I can see. You're good, Paul. The chat room. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about the image that I've chosen for my first slide here, and that reflects, excuse the pun, but an idea, a concept of agency that I have, which is seeing things through a different lens. So maybe taking something that's familiar and looking at it in a different way, looking at it at a different angle um, or combining it with other things and just seeing it in a, in a different way. And I've just put um, a couple of uh, very broad definitions of what um, agency means to me in my context. Um, that I've extracted from our article. Uh, the first one being the sense of control and ownership that students have over their learning. And then the second one is the, the more actionable side of agency from a teacher's perspective, which is the support of learners through the cr creation of, and in inverted commas, enabling conditions, because that term needs a little bit of unpacking. And so what I'm going to be doing in this presentation is, is unpacking those two different things, the sense of ownership that students get over their learning through agency and also how you can create um, enabling conditions, contexts, activities, um, digital learning spaces that facilitate agency. So um, I'm uh, at the moment working quite a large university. In my faculty, we have something like 400 different teachers and recently I just did a show of hands with some of my trainees on the postgraduate certificate in education, um, which compared their feelings about the shift to online learning back at the beginning of the panic pandemic. So we're looking at late February, early March last year, 2020, and early 2021, which is at the beginning of this month. Yes, it was Menti that I used for that. And I think if you have a look at the language, you can see over time, over the last year, there's been a change in attitudes towards the the use of online tools and the shift to online learning spaces out of the physical classrooms. Um, you can see the biggest word on the left-hand side is frustrating. Um, there's a huge amount of frustration. Um, impersonal is in there, complicated, overwhelming, um, workload, confusing, um, Lonely was another one that was interesting. Lonely, this sense of isolation, cold. So all of this, this kind of negative language was was coming out of my colleagues at the beginning um, of the year. And that was really because it was a short, sharp shock. They, they suddenly had to change their practice. We had to adopt lots and lots of different technologies very, very quickly. Um, there was a very steep learning curve 
to to some of those technologies and it it was obviously very disruptive as the, as we've settled into the move to online learning you can see that some of the language has become more positive um the biggest word i think so the biggest two words there or three are active collaboration and creative which if you contrast to the idea of lonely and isolating on on the left hand side it's very good to see that teachers are beginning to see the opportunities for student collaboration, for creativity, and making learning more active um, in through the use of digital tools. Um, so, I, it's not it all. It's not all been bad. I think, in, if anything, the shift to online learning has been a massive accelerator of the acquisition of digital skills um, throughout throughout the, the faculty, throughout the, the schools that we work with. Um, and I'm sure that in, in, from, for the teachers around the world, that's been the case. Now, our courses at the university were always blended learning courses, but that blended learning was interpreted in many different ways. And very often the digital side of things was um, quite monodirectional. It was just you know, a place where students could go to download some files, um, they could download slides from lectures and that kind of thing. But there wasn't a lot of agency or a lot of activity um, on our digital learning platforms. And so what we did very early on was start introducing a lot more training into our um, teacher training qualification, which is the postgraduate certificate in learning and teaching in higher education, so that we could get teachers right at the beginning of their careers and start them using technologies as early as possible and open up their eyes to some of the possibilities um, of learning technologies. Um, and that's that's been something that's been qu quite successful um, over time. There's been this new emphasis on digital learning um, throughout um, the faculty, but the, those um, trainees who've just come off the postgraduate certificate in education are, are starting to develop those skills much, much um, earlier and more fluently. Um, the other thing that's changed is there's been a shift in the language that we use to talk about um, the use of technology in teaching and learning. And we're starting to move away from a term you're probably all familiar with, which is digital literacy for our students and teachers. And we're now starting to move towards talking about digital fluency, which if you if you draw an analogy with language, um, when you're literate in something, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're fluent, that you're able to adapt to different circumstances seamlessly and just jump from one thing to the next, from one context to the next. And so what we're aiming for is at the university is to achieve this level of digital fluency where teachers can just, and students can seamlessly move and swim in the waters of technology without being tethered to any particular tool or platform or way of doing things. And that's obviously a long-term goal, but it's just interesting from a language point of view that the conversation around the use of technology um, is changing. Now, one of the things that we found really important, and this is just a screenshot from, from um, the front page of this course, was to establish expectations for the learners about what they were going to get um, as they moved from a face-to-face -to, -face to an online learning experience. And in terms of um, creating opportunities for different kinds of interaction, um, which is something I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we wanted to be as transparent as possible about the tools and the processes and the expectations of um, on the learner in terms of their part participation. So on this course, we established that there were going to be, there was going to be some pre-recorded videos or lecture content. Then there would be some discussions um, which could be asynchronous. There would be some live sessions. We were using Microsoft Teams. So there would be live sessions. Um, there'd be some pre and post live session work for the students to do. So something they're expected to do before a session and then something that leads out of that. Um, and then there would also be some live webinars and some live tutorials for formative feedback. So I think establishing um, expectations early on was a very, very good move. Um, and I think that that's something that built the foundations for some of the more creative applications of technology that we've been able to explore um, over time. So um, in terms of expectations, when you speak to teachers, very often their expectations um, of students vary greatly when it comes to 
face-to-face uh, -face learning or distance learning, especially in terms of student attention. And one of the biggest complaints that I hear from teachers is when they're teaching um, in Zoom or in Teams, that students are not paying attention, that they feel as though the students are not focused. Um, now, it's difficult, to, it's really difficult to wrestle with that issue because what are you comparing that to? And very often they say, well, in the classroom, there's, you know, I can tell whether the students are focused or not. But is that really the case? And how much of the time in a lesson, if you have a 90 minute lesson, how long can a student maintain focus for in a face to face classroom? Um, how often have you seen students playing with their mobile phones under the table or doing something that isn't on task? And I think sometimes um, with online teaching, teachers can have unrealistic expectations of how long a student can maintain, maintain concentration and how long they're likely to remain focused. And I think that um, we experience that as teachers as well. When we're in long meetings, um, we intelligently tune out of information that we know that we're already familiar with, for example, or so we know that something isn't relevant to us um, in, our con in our context. Um, and so we may tune out, and I'm, I know I'm guilty of this. I may open up my email and answer a couple of emails while there's a meeting going on in the background because I know they're talking about something that, that's not related to me. Um, but it, it is very difficult to manage um, attention with online learning, um, especially in synchronous online learning where the teacher is just speaking. It becomes much, much easier to manage attention when students are doing something. Um, now, the other thing is that if you imagine the, the actual learning space itself, um, in a face-to-face -face situation, that has a very clear identity. There is a, a particular space. It's been laid out in a way that's conducive, hopefully, to learning. Um, teachers have some flexibility about that. With online learning spaces, that's exactly the same thing. You ha they have to be cultivated. They have to be modified. Um, and you have to use tools together and try to create meaning around a space. And if you just think about um, how a student may be physically present in the classroom and spatially present in that environment, but they could be texting somebody on their phone, uh, you know, having a messenger exchange. And so even though they're physically present in the classroom, their attention um, is elsewhere. So they're psychologically absent, but physically present. Um, and their, their um, concentration is all on that social media exchange. Um, so I think it's a, a bit of a, a hard thing to compare, um, you know, the the amount of attention that you're expecting students to pay just because they're online shouldn't be greater than what they would typically be paying in the classroom. Um, now, my my general approach to designing activities for my students um, for online learning is to try to go for the maximum amount of simplicity in terms of the technology that students are using. So rather than bringing in all singing, all dancing, multiple technologies, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, very often using tools that students are familiar with so that you're reducing the cognitive load on the students and on the teacher in terms of having to fiddle around with all of the different technologies and try and get them get them to work. What you want is to have very simple technologies um, working together so that you can focus on designing your lessons for interactive complexity, where you've got groups working together, you've got them reading, writing, listening, speaking, communicating, building something, doing something. So by simplifying and streamlining the technology and making sure they're familiar with it, um, that can really help to reduce that cognitive load and um, overcome that, that kind of limited capacity that we have to focus on, on too many things at, at once, um, especially if they're not contributing to learning. Um, so a really good way to reduce cognitive load is to work with tools that students are already familiar with, um, that they've used in the past, or at least tools that they have some kind of schema already so they know kind of how those tools work. So a student may have used, uh, may have done some video editing uh, in the past. Um, so the fact that you're using a, a slightly different video editing tool from the one they've used at home um, wouldn't involve a huge cognitive load being um, forced upon the student because they've got this schema from how 
typically video editing tools work, so it would be quite quick for them to, to learn how to use a, a new tool and they could draw on that. So what I try to focus on is exploring the affordances that you can have from combining different technologies, simple technologies by bringing them together, how you can create them, um, how you can create something new that is more than the sum of the individual parts, uh, which again is moving towards the idea of digital fluency um, and this idea of enhancing learner agency by creating new ways to solve problems, but with tools that are familiar with them. Um, so if you just have a look at that, uh, that's a very simple visual metaphor of how you can just take three simple shapes, bring them together, create something new that's more than the sum of the parts. So that's really what you're looking for is digital affordance. And that affordance for agency may be hidden um, in the combinations of tools. So there may be one tool alone might not be might not get you where you need to go, but by combining simple tools together, you can create something really special and create activities that really um, uh, enhance student agency. So I'm just going to jump onto my next slide there. So um, there's a really strong relationship between presence, engagement, and agency. And as I mentioned earlier, presence in the physical classroom doesn't necessarily just mean being being present, being physically present. And you need to be attentionally uh, focused and attentionally present, um, not just physically present. And what, what we find is that students who feel as though they're learning in a particular place, so whether that's online or offline, they feel as though that that place has an identity, um, are much more likely to, to be engaged and to feel as though learning is taking place within that environment. Um, there are different ways that you can create presence in online learning environments. And very early on, when our teachers moved from face-to-face -to, -face to online, they would try to to um, be present by lecturing. So they, they would take their two-hour lecture bring that into the online world, open up Teams or Zoom and teach that two-hour lecture. Um, and that was their idea of being present. They were there speaking to the students, but how present were the students? They were just listening. Um, they weren't necessarily interacting. There, were, there, weren't, there may, be, may have been a couple of polls. That, but what actually works much better, and there's, there's lots of research to, to support this, but also in terms of my practice, um, my practical experience with my colleagues, is that in terms of workload, and in terms of creating an environment that feels familiar is to have a high frequency of light contact. So rather than churning out two hour long sessions where you're just speaking, speaking, speaking like I am now, for example, I get the irony there. Um, it's to make sure that students feel as though you're paying attention to what they're doing online, but you don't necessarily have to be sitting there talking for hours at a time. Um, Student, for example, um, many teachers have had issues with discussions and students not participating in online discussion boards and forums. And very often, if you look at what they're doing, you'll see that the teacher themselves are not participating in that discussion. They're just they've given their students something to discuss and then just abandoned that space. But by popping in and just nudging the students just pushing them to expand a little bit more on what they've said to reflect a little bit more on, on, on their comments or maybe respond to the comments of the peers um, and challenging the students uh, can have a huge difference. It can send them off reading, studying, and then they'll come back again to answer you. And I remember from my personal experience of an online course, um, one of my tutors suddenly just questioned a very long comment I'd made by saying, isn't that an example of digital determinism? And at the time, I didn't know what that meant. So I had to go scurrying away, uh, read about digital determinism so I could come back and then try to defend my position with, with my teacher. Um, the other thing is to make in interactivity meaningful. Um, there, there is this idea of, of digital busyness where you're giving students um, work to do so that they're active and but it's not necessarily being active doesn't mean to say that you're you're learning and actively it, being active doing polls for example uh, lots of multiple choice questions which are very easy to do online it doesn't necessarily um isn't necessarily very fulfilling for a learner and very meaningful um the, it's there's not a very 
there's not much depth to the, that kind of surface interactivity there. So uh, another tip is to make interactivity, especially if it's going to be synchronous, as meaningful as possible. Um, that could be sharing projects, uh, could be assigning different roles to students so that they're working together uh, towards building something new or to, towards solving a problem. Um, where students have different pro different um, areas of responsibility and research, uh, which is fantastic for differentiation when you've got mixed mixed ability learners, as as we all have, um, and also reducing the amount of content. So there's a tendency when people move online to saturate students with content. They'll put lots of videos, um, they'll put lots of reading texts, and there'll just be huge amounts of, of video to watch. I've seen one example where a teacher gave students a task of watching 12 videos and then choosing the one that explains something the best, uh, not realizing that one of those videos alone was 45 minutes. So if you imagine how much time the student is spending um, doing that work and not necessarily learning very much from it. So I think reducing the amount of content and increasing the amount of interactivity are very powerful strategies for reducing your own workload and increasing the amount of interactivity and agency for your students. So the ultimate goal um, when you're teaching online is to turn the whatever platform you're using, whether that's Moodle or Canvas, or if you've got your own platform in your school that's, that you're using, is to turn something which is a, a neutral space into a place that has a personality, it has an identity, and it's become meaningful in some way. And the way that places become meaningful in the real world is the same way that they become meaningful in the digital world, which is through interaction through people doing things, through communicating, um, and through the kinds of activities that take place within that in that particular environment. Um, and I think in the article, we recommend taking an ecological approach to building this sense of identity uh, in a learning environment through the kinds of tasks and activities um, that you set for your students. And the teacher can have a huge influence in how online as well as physical spaces um, are perceived. Your, your teachers are interaction designers, they're, they're materials authors creating their own content, they're pedagogues, they're, they're psychologists, and all of these things work together and you change the way that students perceive um, what could be a neutral space into a place that has an identity and meaningful that they want to spend time in. Um, a way of doing that is just through structured, authentic, guided, engaging learning design. So. I'm just going to give a couple of examples now, different approaches that you can take. Um, neither one is better than the other, but they are very, very different. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see a very familiar thing. You've got a jigsaw. On the right-hand side, you've got a couple of Lego bricks. Um, other, other toy bricks are available, I think I have to mention. Um, but if you have a look at the idea of agentic teaching and agentic learning. So the kind of learning that fosters agency, that requires agency. For me, I like to picture that as playful, a playful approach to learning. I like to think of learning as, whether it's a language or whether it's science, as being something that you play with, that you manipulate, that you have to, it, it demands interaction and engagement and it, it demands you to, it gives you feedback on, on what you're doing with it, and it's flexible, and you can look at it in different ways. If you compare a jigsaw, though, for example, well, I love jigsaws, the opportunities for lear learner agency are much more limited than they are with the Lego bricks. I mean, both of those activities, doing a jigsaw, playing with Lego, can be viewed as autotelic, which means that they are meaningful in and of themselves. They don't have to have an external purpose. And they're both intrinsically motivating. People play with bricks and do jigsaw puzzles just because they want to and they find it rewarding. But while a jigsaw may at first glance appear to be more complex, um, you could have a thousand piece jigsaw, and it requires manual dexterity, pattern recognition, shape recognition. You have to concentrate for long periods of time. Um, and there's a, there's a very clear goal. With jigsaws, though, there's only one correct answer, which is that all of the pieces only fit together in one way. And at the end, you've got a single image. And it doesn't matter who's doing the jigsaw puzzle. When they complete it, there's going to be a single correct answer. 
So it's an activity that only requires convergent thinking. So thinking towards getting the right answer. Adding more pieces to the jigsaw puzzle doesn't fundamentally change that activity at all. The mechanics are the same um, and it doesn't allow afford any more agency. On the other hand, if you look at Lego, you can interact with Lego in, in, in a huge number of different ways, um, even if you're given the same initial instructions, which may be to build a car um, or to, to build a shelter or to, to build a spaceship. You could be given the same instructions and people will create something totally different. There'll be different scales, different sizes, and, and it will look um, very, very different. Um, it's a very playful, open-ended activity. And as a tool for learning, um, it's vastly superior to the jigsaw puzzle, it, just in terms of the sheer range of opportunities for this kind of free form, creative, open ended play. And also for you building sort of structured and semi structured activities where, where you're giving them a task that they have to produce with, with Lego. And I think that as a metaphor, for the kinds of activities that we can design for students that will promote learner agency, it's much better to lean towards the Lego model where you've got this kind of modular, um, open-ended, playful, um, non-linear activity than it is to, to use the, the jigsaw puzzle metaphor. Uh, you may well use a use more structured, linear, convergent thinking activities in order to reach the point where students um, are able to do more complex, um, open-ended things. So there's not necessarily one, I wouldn't rule out one, one approach um, over the other. So what I try to do with my own materials, so I'm, I, I generally write my own materials. I write materials for um, OUP and, and, and um, competing publishers uh, as well. And, but for my own classroom materials, um, what I try to do is look for opp opportunities for agency in the spaces between chunks of content or the spaces between the different tools that I'm using for students to, to create something, uh, which I call possibility spaces. And these can be designed into a lesson and they can be signposted. The opportunities um, for a student to diverge from what everybody else is doing and personalize a task, make it meaningful to them, or to approach it in a slightly different way. And the ability to notice and exploit these kind of incidental opportunities and these affordances is a skill that teachers and students have to acquire over time. It's not something you, you know, that you automatically recognize. And I think that that becomes obvious when you look at, um, you know, you look at somebody who's becoming a professional in a particular area. So at the, at the beginning, you may look at something in a particular way and only see a couple of possibilities. But as you learn more about the subject, you start seeing that, that in a different way and you reach this threshold where you're able to be more creative. Um, so I think as materials writers, and I include all teachers in that category, we can support learner agency by including activities that invite curiosity, allow for these multiple paths of exploration, just like with Lego, and where appropriate, leaving gaps in the material where not everything is spelled out for the students. Um, and that can encourage the interpretation and the experimentation and ultimately that kind of intrinsic reward and personal ownership. So what I'm going to do now, I've got about 20 minutes left, is I'm going to show you how this approach that I've been building uh, may look in practice and some examples of lessons that I've used and, and things that I that I think that um, you may be interested in seeing that will take this, this uh, particular approach. So the first one uh, we're going to look at is um, the diving for dialogue um, game. Um, and this is built upon the education edition of Minecraft. And what Diving for Dialogue does is um, it uses something that students, many students will already be familiar with, which is Minecraft. And it's something that helps them to apply their agency to different modalities, um, you know, by creating things within that particular environment. Um, so Diving for Dialogue, it uses the education edition, edition and it blends old and new media. It takes students through an immersive interactive journey in which they engage with problem solving. They have to do some research um, before creating some kind of multimodal output that brings together a whole range of different skills, including digital skills, but also speaking and reading and writing uh, alongside that 
digital literacy. Um, and there, there's um, if you if you just search for it in Google, I mean, I can jump into if I jump into my screen share, I'll just spend a second. I'll just share that with you. You should be able to see that now. So this is the Minecraft Education Edition. Uh, there are lots of pre-made materials that you can look through. Um, and lots of lessons that have already existed, as well as ones you can create yourself. Um, these are aligned to the Australian curriculum, but you can create activities that are aligned to your own. And the lessons that are in there are tagged according to um, to the kind of inter the interaction between different areas. So you've got environment, geography, science, but you may also have some social justice uh, mixed in there as well. And there are all these different lessons that you can look at. Uh, some of them designed for language learning, um, and but those are not necessarily uh, the ones that you will want to use. Very often a lesson that hasn't been um, designed for language learning can be appropriated. Um, to teach a particular subject. So if you're focusing on a particular theme in a course unit, you can have a look at the educational edition of Minecraft and bring in um, some of these activities uh, related to that theme and then turn it into something that's focused um, on language. So I'm going to, ah, I've lost my slides now. What do I have to do to get back to my slides? I just click on slides, I think, is it? Sean, could you, ah, there we go. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've got my slides back there. Okay, the second example um, I'm, I'm going to show you is just the, the idea of open design with um, the planning of your educational materials. So what, you're, what you can see in these three images here, oh yeah, it is, it is free. I can see somebody asking in the chat room, yeah, it is free. Um, what you're seeing here is three different groups of students at three different levels. So we've got, um, I think it was a, an A2, uh, a B1 and a C1 level. Uh, on the European framework of languages, um, doing a similar activity using exactly the same materials, but using them in different ways. So what I had here was a silent movie that was over a hundred years old. Um, it's called Mabel's Blunder. It's freely available uh, online. A lot of black and white silent movies um, are, are in creative, um, are in um, the public domain, so you can use them. And what I did was just design different activities around the activity um, of watching this silent movie and trying to work out what the story was, what people might be saying if there was speech involved in that silent movie. And in the top left image, you can see they're doing some scripting. So they're, they're doing it as a writing activity. Um, in the middle image, there's a high level group. And what they're doing is dubbing the movie with their own voices. So they're doing a live recording of their voices over the top of the um, the silent movie. So they're creating a remediation of that where they're, they're interpreting it with their own voices and their own language. And on the right hand side, you've got a much lower level group um, of adults and they're focusing um, on looking at vocabulary and grammar and doing some research around the the that kind of movie um, and producing that as a project. So, so it was using the same materials so from my perspective. Um, I had a silent movie and then just a couple of photocopies that went alongside it that enabled me to teach using the same materials across three different levels. And in terms of what the students were doing, in terms of learner agency, um, each level could produce as much language as they were capable um, of producing and interpret that video in different ways um, that was meaningful to them. Okay, so my next example um, was a little bit of uh, arts and crafts that, that I engaged in um, at home. And uh, this was a few years ago. So th this is going back probably 2015, something like that. Um, I was really interested in augmented reality. And there was a free app called Erasma that a lot of teachers were using to explore aug augmented reality. And so just with my printer and some glue and some magnets, uh, I created these cubes. And each facet of the cube has a different image. And each of those images triggers a different section of a video. So the students could watch with the phones. They could pick up one of the cubes, scan it with their, their phones, and that would trigger a little video clip. What they then had to do was work out which of the images and which of the clips um, belonged to the same video. And then they had to build a shape that allowed that video to play from beginning to end by physically um, building an object to 
tell the story um, of the film. I know that that sounds a little a little bit uh, a little bit complicated, um, but it was something that was an example of a hybrid digital physical um, uh, lesson. So there was digital media, but it was being taught synchronously in the classroom. The students were scanning using their phones. Um, and then there was discussion and real physical inter interaction as they were passing the cubes and exchanging them and communicating as well. So a digital activity doesn't have to be just a digital activity. It can be something that creates new affordances for learner agency, and things can grow out of them um, in terms of face-to-face -face communication or in terms of creating something new. So I'm going to jump to my next example, um, place-based narrative. So I'm a really big fan of um, Google Earth, and there are some fantastic tools. There's a new set of creation tools now in Google Earth that allows you to turn the digital globe into your own canvas for telling stories, for mapping routes, for creating literature tours, um, for telling you know a, a historical narrative, for example, uh, or for just talking about the place where you live. Um, the new tools allows you allow you to use Google Earth as a kind of canvas. You can draw your own place markers, lines, and shapes to connect different places, and then you can attach your own text, images, uh, videos to these locations in order to build up a story or a tour. And the finished project product is something that you can share with other people um, so that they can explore that. And in terms of um, assessment for learning, this is a really fantastic um, example of a project-based learning task that has um, a huge amount of learner agency, a huge amount of choice um, and control, but also creativity. And also it's an authentic task that leads to a project a product that can be shared and critiqued um, as a as a peer assessment activity, or even as a kind of geographic portfolio um, of learning. And I've seen some some fantastic examples of this with students creating literature tours of all of the different places um, that are mentioned in Harry Potter novels and what that means to them, which ones they visited. It could be a narrative of a family member, um, somebody or a grandparent who was in the war and all of the different places where they were based and you know, combine that with some digital images from those times. So there's an infinite amount of um, ways that you can use tools like this uh, to, to create these kind of open-ended tasks that students can um, can put their stamp on, but at the same time are aligned with the teaching and assessment um, of the course that you're working on. Now, with just about 10 minutes left, uh, I'm going to jump to probably my favorite example um, of tools for digital agency and in terms for learner agency, and that is um, video games. Now, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of using video games in education. It's something that I've been uh, looking at for ages. I'm a big fan of James Paul G, who wrote a book back in the early 2000s um, called What Video Games Can Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. And what G did was analyze lots and lots of video games that he played with his grandson and extract from those games um, sound pedagogical principles. And he actually listed 36 pedagogical principles in his book that he could identify in good video games. So video games are, I think, by, by definition, probably the most agentic form of media. So unlike a video where you click play uh, and then watch, a video game doesn't do anything unless you do something. You have to make decisions. You have to operationalize that game and make it work in the same way that you make a bicycle work. You have to get on and you have to, you have to, you know, put your energy, your agency into playing that game. So the example I've got here is a game that we use with primary school children, but it, it's fantastic for adults as well. And it's just called Bad News. Uh, this is a game from 2017. It's a free online game that you can play with students. And the whole game has been designed to help people understand how fake news and conspiracy theories can spread online. Now, this was developed by a Dutch organization in combination or collaboration with some researchers at the University of Cambridge. And the idea around this game is to, you know, um, to kind of create a vaccine against um, 
students being affected by disinformation and conspiracy news and, and fake and fake news. And so the basic idea is to build resistance against disinformation by putting players in the position of the people who create this kind of media. And by creating it yourself, you gain insight into the kinds of tactics and methods used by real fake news um, creators to, to spread their lies. And so you build up this, this resistance. The game works in a really simple way. On the left-hand side, you can see your score going up in terms of the number of followers that you get. Uh, just below that, there's a credibility meter, to, which shows how, how much uh, people believe what you're saying. And the researchers have written papers about this that show play through playing the game, um, students become more resistant to the influence of fake news. And there are many, many um, games that afford this kind of agency that have a rhetorical message in them where a student has to play the game um, and then you can lead out of that game into classroom discussion or into online discussion. Um, and over time, they can learn something just through the action of playing that game, even if there's no pure didactic content um, hidden within it. So this is a game uh, called Bad News. I highly recommend that you check it out. Uh, the, in the screenshot, you can see here, um, this is from an early part of the game. I think I've played it for about 10 minutes. A vaccine against misleading information. Let's keep going. Um, I've just been congratulated. And now my next choice is whether to pull the strings of emotional fear or anger by tweeting something, for example. So let me just move on now. I've only got uh, seven minutes left. So I'm just going to um, finish with some, some tips um, for things that you can do to improve agency in online learning. Um, I will say that many of these things also apply to um, classroom teaching um, and that they can help students to build confidence and autonomy, regardless of whether the learning is taking place um, purely online or in hybrid spaces. Um, or blended learning, for example, or as what we're doing in the university, we're experimenting with something called unified active learning, where we have some students who are physically present in the classroom and other students who synchronously are um, on Teams at home. Um, and then they, they are, we are streaming the lesson directly to them and they can communicate with the students who are inside the classroom and work in groups with them. So the lines between online and face-to-face -face learning are becoming quite blurred in, in these um, complex times. So the first tip is to ensure alternative assessment strategies are ready and that the technologies work. So going back to what I said earlier about technological simplicity, yes. Um, interactional complexity, yes. But what you don't want um, are um, activities in which the students are going to spend an inordinate amount of time learning how to use new tools. Um, I highly recommend that if you're going to use any technology with your students for any kind of activity, um, whether it's just a simple Mentimeter or Padlet or whether it's something more sophisticated like video production, you do it yourself first, you practice with colleagues, you make sure that you are absolutely confident in using these tools before you use them with your students and you work backwards from your learning objectives. You look at your curriculum, um, you work backwards and you do con constructive alignment to make sure that the end product of the digital learning is aligned with the learning goals of your course or with your particular unit that you're focusing on. Um, second tip is that staff teams can self and peer assess their digital capability and support each other. This is something that we've introduced at the university with a kind of buddy system um, where we encourage uh, student, uh, our teachers to collaborate on teams, to test things out, to try lessons out with each other and to give each other feedback um, including things like how agentic did they feel? Did they feel as though that they were playing a meaningful role in that learning or were they passively um, just sitting back and, and watching? Um, so I think working with your colleagues, sharing ideas, pooling your resources and supporting each other and developing your digital capabilities um, is a really powerful, powerful way to, to improve. Um, next tip is to, I've just jumped over one, have I? Let me just go back, sorry. I think I jumped, I jumped one there. Uh, there we go. 
there we go. So, uh, sorry, tip number three, planning to, if you are increasing the amount of reading material or short videos, make sure that it is meaningful. Make sure that you have an associated challenge. Um, a video should inform, but also inform action. So rather than just watching a video and then answering a question or just summarizing it, can, what can they do um, now that they've watched that video? Has it enabled them to do something? Has it created a new affordance for them to demonstrate their agency in some way? Instead of watching the video, could they have created the video? And could they have done that um, uh, as a peer project-based learning um, activity? Um, Look at how you scaffold these tasks as well, because don't forget, not all, all learners um, are equally able to perceive the opportunities for agency. So going back to the jigsaw versus the Lego, um, some will be very secure and happy doing a jigsaw, but feel anxious and frustrated when they're suddenly asked to do something that's more creative and more open-ended. Um, what I find is useful is to gradually build from structured tasks and heavily scaffolded tasks and leading into more playful approaches to using language or to, to creating things with language. Um, and fourth tip is use formative feedback systematically and consistently get students used to it. This is about establishing expectations and building the formative feedback into the activity itself so you're not creating new work for yourself. Um, I'll just refer you to the example of the Google Earth tools in which the end product of a student creating a tour about their grandparents' experience of being in the war, for example, would be a portfolio that demonstrates their learning of their language, of their grammar, of the vocabulary, of their writing skills, of their videos, you know, of their speech, that kind of thing. So you're building in assessment um, into those digital, creative, open-ended, student-led inquiry tasks. And just finishing one final tip here is to take advantage as much of, as possible of online tools. Um, you don't necessarily need to be limited to the tools that your institution provides you with. There is, there's such an ocean of free tools out there that it's just a question of discovery. And that's something, again, that you can do with colleagues where you explore different things. Uh, so take advantage of the affordances of these to provide the kind of ongoing embedded focus assessment that is useful in terms of um, feed forward. So students get feedback from engaging with those activities as they do by playing a game. You get that kind of immediate feedback that's useful to you. Um, and look at how the tasks that you create with your students can redefine group dynamics, they can recalibrate expectations of your learners for what agency means to them. So I'm going to, I think my time is running short, I'm just going to um, finish with a quick summary there of just re reminding you that you may have some very, very simple tools um, available to you, but you are empowered to use those tools and combine those tools in ways that can lead to something that's much more powerful than the sum of its parts. Um, use video production with your students. Um, use audio production with your students. Don't think of media as something that's all just to be consumed. Think of it in terms of learner agency and something your students can create and collaborate and build together. Think of your lesson planning, your lesson design is this highly combinatorial, playful approach to ed educational technology um, and try to create these kind of open transmedia um, learning experiences. And I will just finish now by asking if there are any questions. There are, Paul. So if you could click on the Q&A tab and then click on uh, publish, you'll find them there. Okay. And could I ask you when you've chosen the question to answer, and you've got about four minutes, um, when you've chosen the question to answer, could you re say the name of the person and repeat the question so the audience know what you're doing? Uh, okay. Um, did I did I keep to time there? Oh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, yes, you've got time to answer questions. So the, the countdown, I can see the countdown on the other screen. So you've got about four minutes before. Ah, okay. Okay. All right. So there's some really good questions in here. Let me just scroll through. Oh, there's lots, 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 and lots, and lots. Um, so from Karima C, we've got how can teachers help students avoid plagiarism during online tasks or exams? Ah, right. So that's less, that's not really a question about learner agency. Um, that's a really good question. So to, I, what I what I look at when I'm using did 
digital tools is to try to build the assessment into the product itself. So when I, I refer you to that example of the, the Google Earth one or the Minecraft one, where students are producing an artifact that uh, has clearly come from them. Um, so even if they're doing working on something collaboratively, they've got clearly defined roles. And I know one example of a university, for example, uh, in which the uh, the roles were divided. The students were tasked with creating a podcast. Um, each student had a different role in that. And the students themselves had to describe um, what their role was. And that had to be verified by the other students. So there was kind of a peer verification there. I mean, there, th if you're looking at summative assessment, there are lots of proctoring tools, which I'm not a big fan of because, you know, the that's somebody sitting down, they've got cameras and they've got all this kind of monitoring going on to make sure that they're not asking somebody else for help. Or So I would try to avoid those kinds of summative tasks as much, as much as possible. But I will move on to some of the other questions just because that's slightly off at a tangent from learner agency. Um, can these, from Andre D, can these brainstorming techniques uh, be done by students online? I asked because I've done mind maps that were very tactile and I don't want to lose out on that. Oh, I'm not sure what a tactile mind map would be, but definitely, um, for so for example, just the other day, I was working with a group of students. We were using an ordinary tool that they were familiar with, Microsoft Word, and we were doing some collaborative brainstorming and we were speaking to each other in teams at the same time. So everyone would just go quiet. I'd say, okay, we've got five minutes, we're just going to go quiet. I want everyone to work on this task collaboratively. Everybody could see what everybody else was writing and where they could also communicate with, with us at the end of that and have a discussion around it. So I'd say yes to that. Uh, Andre D, establishing rules early on. Uh, could I do the Malcolm Knowles thing with this thing and have students each develop our online class rules? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a, a really good idea. Um, you, you could negotiate those rules and expectations. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Uh, what's Canvas formative feedback from Sharon J? Ah, oh, now, so, sorry, that's my my fault. Canvas is the learning management system that we use at the at the university. Um, it's something like you may be familiar with Moodle, or you may have a learning platform in your school or your institution, um, and. Formative feedback was just pr providing students with feedback um, that would be useful to them before they finished a task, so before the summative assessment. Um, from Immaculada R, one of the difficulties I find is to obtain feedback when teaching online. It becomes less spontaneous or real. How can this be solved? Oh, that's a philosophical question about what is real. Um, that's a tricky one. So feedback, one, I think... One more question, Paul. Yeah, uh, okay, all right. Um, I'm just looking if there's one that I can answer in one minute. Uh, Rodica C, could using can-do statements and online assessments, quizzes, et cetera, help students develop some form of agency? Absolutely, yeah. I think that's quite a simple, a simple way uh, of achieving it, yeah. And are there any specifics to doing light workload limits? I'm not sure what that one is. I think, have I run out of time, um, Sean? You're, you're going to have 20 seconds if you've got a quick answer. Um, is the Minecraft app free from Alison D? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, there you go. <laughs> that, that was a quick answer. I'll give you that. Yeah. So, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't get through more of those. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, you did a very good job of trying to get through as many as you can. I, hats off to you. Um, and you, as you can see, uh, as you can see there, um, there is um, a lot of thank you coming into the chat box. We are going to move in 30 seconds. Uh, Paul, your last slide. Uh, can you? So the pop-up on the screen, folks, you can click on the cross and it will disappear. But if Paul could go to his last slide and then we'll oh, um, allow um, you to... Um, yeah, I've lost... Uh, I have to get yeah, back out of the chat. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, I can't get back onto... Ah, um, screen. Can, no, we, have uh, the, can we have the position? It doesn't matter. We're going to run slides. out. There we go. There we go. There we go. I'm back on slides. Now. Hang on. All right, everybody, you're about to move. So we'll see you. Okay.